Welcome to the Next Level Human Podcast. As a human, you have a job to do. In fact, you have four jobs. To earn and manage money, to attain and maintain health and fitness, to build and sustain personal relationships, to find meaning and make a difference. None of these jobs are taught in school. And that is what this podcast is designed to do. To educate us all on living our most fulfilled lives through the mastery of these four jobs. I'm your host, Dr. Jay Tita, and I believe we are here living this life for three reasons and three reasons only. To learn, to teach, and to love. In this podcast, I will be learning, teaching, and loving right along with you. I'm grateful to have your company. Here's to our next level. Welcome to the show, everyone. Uh, Today, I have another really special episode. I got to have my good friend Johnny Bowden on last week, last episode. And this episode, I have another really special person and a very close friend of mine, someone who inspires me, someone who I've had the uh, pleasure to know the last couple years and been on his podcast um, several times and just someone who I just really respect and admire, who I think is doing absolutely amazing things in the natural medicine world. And he really doesn't need an introduction because a lot of you know him and have been listening to his show for some time. He has the number one health and fitness podcast in the country, probably the world. Sean Stevenson of the uh, Model Health Show. Sean is uh, somebody who has just really, in my opinion, and I was telling him this, you know, um, I always try to tell him this, and I try to tell people this who you know are making a big difference. He's one of these people who is extremely humble, extremely humble. He just goes about his work, and he does it with a passion and a flair that really inspires all of us. But even someone like Sean needs to be told, you know, listen, you are doing magical, magical stuff. And he has put out um, a new book. This is a extremely powerful book. Now, listen, I am in the health and fitness world. I've written seven books. Um, I've written in the nutrition space, in the metabolism space. Sean is one of the best, if not the best, at this work, in my opinion. And so we are going to be chatting a little bit about his story because I just want people to know a little bit more about him. He is a phenomenal man and has a phenomenal story. He is also just a, a genius dude in the way that he educates and inspires and shows up every day um, for all of us. His new book is Eat Smarter, Use the Power of Food to Reboot Your Metabolism, Upgrade Your Brain, and Transform Your Life. And it actually is interesting. I got an advanced copy and uh, was skimming through it prior to this episode that uh, you're getting ready to listen to and have since finished it. And it really is on every single page. You are going to find a really amazing stuff. For those of you who are health and fitness masters and enthusiasts, I know at this show, a lot of you are very savvy. Most of you are professionals. Um, this is going to be a book you're going to want to recommend to your clients. It's also going to be a book you yourself are going to get a lot out of. And he he did what he does so nicely. He has a way of teaching that educates the professional and the, uh, you know, sort of novice all at the same time. So Sean Stevenson is uh, someone I am really excited to introduce all of you to if you don't know him already. Now, before we get started, I do want to talk about the sponsors to the show. They are the ones who make this possible, and they are also uh products that I use myself. The first one is Cured Nutrition. They are a CBD company. I use them every single day. I use them to help me sleep better. They have a whole line of products, but the one that I love most is their Zen product. I take three of those every night before I go to sleep. I get horrible deep sleep in general. This has made a difference. It hasn't quite got me all the way way there yet, but it is one of these products that is the only thing that's even Uh, bumped my deep sleep up at all. And so I cannot speak highly enough about Cured Nutrition. Check them out. Um, Use the code NEXTLEVEL. You will get a discount 
uh, for their products. I highly recommend them. My other sponsor, another product that I use almost every single day is Paleo Valley. I eat their meat sticks. It is one of the most convenient sources of clean protein. These are grass-fed beef that are fermented in a way that is a natural way, almost like the Native Americans used to eat their pemmican and jerkies and things like that. It's a phenomenal product. Paleo Valley has a lot of products that they use. They're all fantastic. The ones I love are the jalapeno meat sticks and their original meat sticks. Check them out. Paleo Valley, use the code next level to get a discount as well. Please uh, take care of the sponsors. It's a win, win, win. You get amazing products and a discount. They get to sale and I get a little bit of a kickback and you get to have this show continue as a result of them working with me and me working with them. All right, so let's get to my boy. I'm, I was super excited for this. I hated it. I didn't have a whole lot of time to talk to Sean before and after, so we just had to jump right in, and we got started, and he brings the good stuff, as he always does. Enjoy the show. Make sure you get his book, and I will see you all at the next episode. I'm here with my good friend, Sean Stevenson. You kind of don't really need any introduction, but just in case people don't know who you are, let me just love on you and brag on you just for a minute. So you could just sit there and have the halo sort of shine on you. I, I honestly see you, man. It's funny. My, um, my sister-in-law, I think, was on your show, the Model Health Show, um, before I was. And it's funny, in, in this field, I don't know if you're like this, Sean, but in this field, I tend to, I don't know what it is, I tend to just get in my own bubble. There's not a whole lot of people that I really like to listen to because it's just so noisy. But when I got sort of uh, introduced to you, I was just like, this guy is just extraordinary in the way that he teaches, the way that he makes this fun, and just his level and depth of knowledge. I almost, and, and even recently, anyone who's been following you recently, I almost feel like you are, it's almost like you're the, the wellness consciousness of America right now, right? So you're, you're basically um, bringing this thing for us to understand and how to manage getting through this pandemic crisis, if we didn't know that wellness was important before, we certainly do now. And so for me, you've really become, honestly, and I don't think I've shared this with you, but I just love doing this kind of stuff in person and also in front of other people because you've come for me, uh, for me, you become a, a, an educator and um, someone who I learn from a ton. And also, um, just someone who I essentially just go, you know what? Someone is doing it right. Like you and I, we certainly have discussions. We even come from different sides of the fence uh, sometimes, but it's always a discussion of evidence based with you. And that's what I love so much. So welcome to the show, my man. And for those of you who don't know, the Model Hell Show is, I, what is it, man? It's like, it's the number one. It's always the no, one or two in the world in, in health, right? I mean, this show is like just yeah. crushing it. Yeah, fitness and nutrition, we're typically number one in the U.S., which is bananas. It's, 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 bananas. it's so cool. And it's funny, too, because talking to you, man, it's like the other thing you guys will love about Sean and anyone who knows you probably knows this about you. You are incredibly humble, which even makes it all the more interesting. Now, you're no stranger to best-selling books. You wrote a best-selling book called Sleep Smarter, which is just still crushing it and all over the world. You have a new book out, and I have it right here. It's Eat Smarter. This is Sean's new book, and um, I haven't got a chance to read the whole thing yet, but I have been, you know, sort of dipping into it and skimming through it. And I know you've been doing a lot of these interviews, so I want to start, if I can, just a little bit uh, in a slightly different uh, place, perhaps, and we'll get into the science of the book in a minute. But one of the things that I think I know about you is you are an incredibly purpose-driven guy, and I want to know... Um, a little bit, because this is a Next Level Human podcast. So I want to know a little bit behind what's behind Sean Stevens and your mission and your story. And why are you even doing this, man? Like why this, I know in several of these. I know how much this takes. And I also go through and I look and how well this thing is referenced. This is a lot, a lot of work. I want to know, like, what is driving you, man? Because obviously you are putting out this show constantly. You are writing books. You are, you are educating all of us. I want to get a little bit into the next level human nature of Sean Stevens. I love you, man. This is why I love talking with you. These are you getting me to like dig inside, take a look and see what's going on in my inner recesses. 
you know, what's coming up for me and why I'm doing this, because truly I could exist in my own little bubble, my own little vacuum, you know, put out, here's three tips for, you know, weight loss, whatever. But I just really feel a deep, deep, deep pull to, to really just number one, and this is going to, I haven't really shared this before, but to really reach my potential, you know, and my potential, I know, I just feel we get to choose our beliefs, but I believe that my potential is rooted in serving humanity and really doing the best that I can to help to uplift other humans and to be the best that we can possibly be. And cyclically, like we see a lot of things repeating themselves in history, but then that we do have these quantum leap moments, you know? And so right now I just feel like there are so many people who are suffering, who don't realize that there is another way. Like myself, I was born into conditions where being in pain, being sick, being unhealthy, being obese is just what we know. And so I want to be a model. I want to help to create exposure for other people that I just seemingly by these chance encounters got exposure to that helped me to transform my own life, my own health. You know, when I was in college, I lived in Ferguson, Missouri. And I slept on a mattress on the floor. I was trying to make a better way from, you know, change the kind of path of my lineage, you know, but I just grew up in conditions where I might wake up in the morning, my mother as a black guy, there's blood on the floor, you know, every, like, we're just fighters, you know, we're fighting, we're fighting amongst each other, but we all banded together to fight against a common enemy outside of us, which humans tend to do, you know, but just, it was an atmosphere where even walking out my door, you know, there's a threat. You know, I might, I might die today. You know, it's very real circumstances that many people are living in here in the United States. And with the health aspect, of course, I'm inundated with, I didn't know that there was a difference. I didn't know there was a difference between my bologna and like some wild caught salmon. It's just stuff. It's just stuff you eat. And the sheer amount of craziness, the processed food, the fast food that we were around, I didn't know that there was anything else but that, you know? And so, Coming from that place and, you know, when I was in college and living in Ferguson, I was battling with my own health issues, you know, and so-called incurable degenerative spinal condition, you know, this basically severe kind of advanced arthritic condition of the spine where I'm 20 and my physician tells me I have the spine of an 80-year-old man. And also, you know, 15 years old at track practice, I broke my hip just running. You know, my body was just breaking down from the inside. And conventional systems of medicine just saw it as like, this is incurable, something you're going to have to deal with. They put me on medication day one when I went in and got that scan done on my spine. I saw three more doctors over the course of the next two years. And fortunately, and I always recommend folks always get a second, third opinion if there's any kind of life devastating uh, diagnosis, but they all told me the same thing, you know, and each one of them put me on a new prescription. And each one of them told me bed rest. I could walk. I could still walk. I was in pain. Why would you have this young man on bed rest? You know, and so I didn't, it wasn't just my spine beginning atrophy. Everything was. And so uh, to put a button on the story and, you know, why I'm doing what I'm doing, there were these moments, but it really started from within myself because over those two years, I was habitually asking these questions in my mind. Every day was on automatic. Why me? Why me? Why won't somebody help me? And the human brain is a servo mechanism. You know, it's this thing, and I talk about this in Eat Smarter. It's it's called instinctive elaboration. The human brain is just hardwired to answer the questions that it's posed. And sometimes, of course, they're just kind of running again unconsciously, but it's searching out as to filter information. Because even right now, as everybody's listening, we have trillions of bits of data coming in that your brain has to filter and figure out what's most important. You know, there's information coming in even to our toes right now, you know, we might have just thought about our toes a little bit, but it's just like, was that happening before where my toes gone? No, it's just a filtering of our focus. And so after two years, I finally asked a different question when I got it, like they're, they're, they're continuing to tell me the same thing. And I asked this very simple thing of myself. I asked, what can I do to get better? And it changed everything. I started to see different things and I got exposure. A friend of mine was, I didn't know what the hell she was doing. I thought it was like 
It's just super weird. You know, she's like, they're cracking each other's back. But she's a chiropractor, you know, and she went to school for all these years. And, you know, we were like, we'd hang out from time to time. But now she took me to a health food store, took me to Wild Oats. I literally had no idea that it existed. I walked into this weird alter reality and I saw books that had answers to the questions that I had. And so at the end of the day, man, with my own experience and coming back from something that's supposedly incurable, it creates a level of power in me that I have to share. It creates a level of experience in me that cannot be replicated. I have to share it. And if we can get more people exposure to these ideas, to these principles, just to conditions that can fortify and support their health, I must do it. So that's what drives me. Yeah, well, you know, so this, it, all of you who are listening to me, and I, I just want to uh, share this with you, Sean, to see what your take is on this. Here's, here's what I hear, right? It's so interesting about how, how we sort of live our lives. A couple things happen. You had deep pain, okay? Now, this is physical pain you had, but you also kind of painted a picture where there's psychological turmoil there, too. When you're waking up first thing as a little kid and you're wondering, is it safe outside? This is psychological pain as well. One of the things that always strikes me, and this has been the case in my clinical career, is that people with pain, pain, pain has a way of snapping your attention, right? Perhaps, perhaps maybe that's the whole point of pain in the first place, because once your attention is grabbed, then you can begin to ask the question. So there's two things that have to happen there. One, you have to realize maybe pain is trying to teach me something. And two, you have to realize maybe there's an important thing that I'm missing, which then spurs questions. And to me, this is the beginning of the path to purpose. To me, what happens is your pain is unique because your circumstances are unique. So the questions you ask are going to be unique. And once you ask those questions, all of a sudden, unique answers begin to come. And it's almost like at that point, this is very a very Taoist kind of philosophy. At that point, you're kind of put in the flow of the river. You start moving in a particular direction. Certain scenery starts showing up. You get to sort of choose which direction you go down. And you took all of that and essentially said, I will take my pain and look to heal it in other people, which is why we now have the Model Health Show, which is why we now have Sean Stevens, the teacher, which is why we now have Sleep Smarter and now Eat Smarter. And to me, I want to see what you sort of think about this, because to me, every time I talk to someone who's been incredibly successful, and I know you're super humble, and you know you and I could talk about, well, there's luck and there's this and there's that. But every time I talk to someone who's been very successful, it really comes down to finding this path and then chasing it. And I just want to know from you, what were like the signs and the, the, the things that made you just go? And, we're, and I want to know your doubts too, man. I don't know how much you've talked about that, but surely along the way, you know, you're just like, okay, well, do I need to get a doctorate degree? What do I need to do? What are the doubts that you're having? And what kept you going to get to this point? I think it's such an important conversation to have that I want to hear from you. And then I want to go into exactly what you are teaching. Awesome. Yeah. It's such a great question. You know, the thing about the human mind, we need points of affirmation, you know, to know that we're doing the right thing or we're on the right track. You know, there are some people we, you know, we might call them insane who venture out and they, they try to create something or do something that's never been done before and without affirmation until maybe the thing happens. But along the way, there's still going to be little things that keep them going, whether it's an internal or external thing. We're looking for affirmation. And for me, you know, once I transformed my own health, you know, I went from again, and in that two year sp span of getting a permission slip to not do anything, you know, from folks that I deemed to be much more aware of what was happening in my body than I, than I was, um, giving me permission to not do anything, like I didn't do anything. And so I gained a lot of weight and I was, man, probably just everything that you can, I probably had high blood pressure, insulin resistance, depression, everything. You just, you name it. And going from that place to within a matter of months, just having this weight, just flying off my body, having this vitality, and I'm finally sleeping better. That was my biggest struggle for those two years was, you know, my pain was so bad, I couldn't sleep well. And, you know, but not just that. And as you mentioned, my body didn't just change, my mind changed. And we can't, we can talk about which one caused the other, but it's really a both and world. 
you know, so I start to see the world differently, you know, and food isn't just food, it's information, you know, so I'm making my body out of things that just have my brain working in a different way. And so once this physical transformation happened, I was still in school, I was barely hanging on. I went from a 12 credit load to, 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 to three, like I was barely hanging on. I was just embarrassed. I was in pain. I just barely made it to school. And so now I'm, I'm on campus. I'm feeling better. The new semester started and people see me that had seen me kind of walking around campus. Like I've seen myself then as just like a ghost, like a little a zombie walking around. And people started coming up to me. You know, the craziest thing. When, I remember one day I was walking out of my prof- one, one class. My professor came up to me, stopped me at the door. He was like, what did you do? I was like, what the f- What are you talking about? <laughs> He was like, you look so healthy. And I've kind of felt like it was a crime or something, but I, it was so startling to him. I didn't look like a person who just lost weight. I looked like a person who was like radiantly healthy yeah. compared to that person who was like a shell, like a shell of a person before. And so my first, so I started working with my professors, fellow students, you know, and uh, one of them, like my very first client that I worked with, <clears throat> she was a friend uh, of, of, of a friend of mine from high school. So one of my good friends from high school is her, is his little sister. And she would, she's just like, can you help me? And I was like, sure, I'll see you at the gym, you know, on Saturday, whatever. She was like, how much should I pay you? I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> my brain time froze. You're going to pay me for something that I would do for free. I didn't know that existed. I didn't know that was a thing, you know? And so for, those were those little moments of, aspir- uh, of affirmation. And so I started working with her and then the next person, the next person getting this certification. I shifted my coursework in school back to, because I went to school, you know, I went to a school that had a well-noted, like prestigious pre-med track, a private university at first, but I hated science. I hated it. I absolutely. <laughs> That's crazy it. to hear, man. <laughs> Dude, for years, I would have, I would have bad dreams about biology class. I swear to God. And so the cra- right, and the crazy thing is, I'm obs- I'm so deeply science is my boo. You yeah. know, it's like I've got my wife and I've got science, but it's because, and I believe this was part of my story, part of my dharma, is to be so disenchanted by the way I was taught before, and it, it just didn't connect. It was, and the way that I teach today, it makes it visceral. It makes it connect for people, which I lacked then. And so I shifted my coursework back to that. You know, studying biology nutritional science, kinesiology, all that good stuff. And then once I graduated, I opened up a clinical practice and I just saw somebody yesterday. I'm in Los Angeles right now. I just saw somebody yesterday who met me at my office in St. Louis. I had no idea. He came up to me. He was like, do you remember such and such? And I was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Really? He was like, yeah, I just bumped it to you in the hallway. And I had he, he said that he was carrying some 22 ounce something, Starbucks, whatever. And I told him a little bit of like some ingredients. He was like, you blew my mind. I started listening to your show that day and I've listened to every show since. And the reason I bumped into him was because his wife was this massive like influencer, you know, quote influencer. And he put her on to me, you know, from that chance encounter at my office in St. Louis, Missouri. I love That's that. Cool. It just happened yesterday. So don't you love stories like this, man? It's just amazing. I could, it was, it freaked me out. It just totally freaked me out. And just to put a little cherry on top of this is, you know, through, through each of these steps, the biggest thing for me, Jade, and, uh, and I know that you of course have had these moments when you take your experience, as I mentioned, I have to share this forward and, and like you, you framed it beautifully and like healing, healing my pain in other people. Once I actually started to see those things happen, you know, folks coming in who have just overwhelming, you know, their cycle because of, you know, fibroid tumors and helping them to reverse those conditions. And folks who are coming in, they're on metformin and insulin or lisinopril and statins and all these things. And of course, working alongside with, you know, other healthcare professionals and just helping them to, to, to finally be free and to be able to live the life that they were born to live. Seeing these things happen. And oftentimes I work with a lot of folks who were given the same bill of goods I was, that there's nothing you can do about this. And seeing that replicated over and over and over again, that that was not the end of their story. Like, man, it just, again, it just lights me on fire so much because I know what's possible with humanity. And so that's what really keeps me going is that that feeling. It's, I guess I never really even talked about this out loud, but it's so deeply ingrained in every cell in my body 
I can, there's nothing anybody can do to stop me from sharing this perspective and sharing my voice. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's amazing when you get into alignment with purpose in, in that way. It's just you, what you do is you talk to people and they feel incredibly fulfilled. Let's, let's get into the book, though, because here's, here's where I want to start this, right? So here's the interesting thing. If, if you all are listening to Sean, and, I, and those of you who have listened to this podcast previously, one of the things you'll hear from him, you just heard from him, he's done this again and again and again. So have I. Sean and I could sit here and talk and we could tell you stories about, oh, yeah, we work with this person with cancer. They're cancer free. We work with this person with Hashimoto's thyroiditis and they no longer have antibodies to thyroid. We, we've worked with all these things that essentially people say couldn't be cured. And of course, Sean and I know that's a bad word, cured, but we're going to say it on here, cured, right? Now, I am imagining, because this is what I know about you and same in my, in my work, to me, the thing that I love about books, and I know you're a you read like crazy. Both of us do. One of the things is this is a download of Sean Stevenson's brain, right? This is, this is everything all in one place. To get all the information in this particular book, you have to go and listen to every single model health show that Sean has ever done, plus sit down and talk to him, plus, and it's all in a book. This is what these downloads essentially are. Now, not everybody although you should, and I know this about Sean, so he's not going to have a problem with this. Not everyone's going to be able to get this book. Tell us, give us the hard sort of, uh, sort of um, take-homes with this. What are the things that you just go, Jade, here, here are the things, the top one, two, three things in this book that if no one read it, these are the things that really make the difference in why this thing is different. And I've already picked up a couple things, but I'm going to sort of let you sort of start because what I really want people to understand is um, what is the mindset that they should be approaching works like this with and, and basically giving them the beginnings of the journey? Yes, it's, it's a great question. Uh, I believe that one of the biggest ideas that I'm working to uh, impress upon culture and to just make a part of our, our lexicon, our way of living, and and again, like I've done this before with my last book, Sleep Smarter. It it I it took me a while to really get it. You know, it's translated in 20 different languages and it's an international bestseller, all of this stuff. But more so, I was doing um a talk for Tom Brady's company uh a couple of uh months ago, and they have sleep wellness coaches, and they're like using my language, like some of the things that I framed up in a way that makes sense, you know, from the clinical data, but they don't know where it came from. You know, and it's just so powerful, the power of an idea. Yep. And I and I really am living by the statement right now that there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Yep. And right now, for us to truly get this, the big idea that I'm working to impress upon culture, unfortunately, when people think about nutrition and diet, it's largely related to weight, psychologically, for most people. When in reality, and that's that mindset, even though that, that is a factor has not served us. We are now, right now, here in America, the sickest society in human history, self-inflicted. We have over 200 million people who are overweight or obese, over 135 million people with diabetes or pre-diabetes. Right now, about 60% of Americans have some degree of heart disease and hardening of the arteries, you know, and the list goes on and on. All men are problems. Everything keeps getting worse. What are we going to do about this? We have to have a better association with food. And so the idea and the, the mission is to reaffirm and to create more legs under the belief on how much food matters, because here's what food really is. Food is one of the most dynamic, complex, powerful entities in the universe. It creates our brain cells, you know, our neurons, the dendrites, the axon terminals, the things that allow us to have thought and feeling and emotion, our heart, our heart, our arteries, the blood that runs through them is made from the food that we eat. All of these things, even people being able to hear our voices right now, the, the tiny bones and the electrical signals and all that, these are made from the food that we eat. And now we're, we have to have a shift in understanding how remarkable food is. But unfortunately, it's been put into this pithy little box of if we're trying to get healthy. And this is what I was taught in my nutritional science class, calories. Calories are the king. It's the monarch. It's the, the warden of the prison. It is everything. 
Day one, this is what we're taught, manage calories and we can manage health. Manage calories, we can manage weight. And how has that served us as humanity? Of course, there are going to be folks who find success in looking at that metric, but there's so much more. And so something that else that adds a leg under that belief system, because that's the thing I want to talk about most as far as a big idea takeaway, but the other parts that give the belief legs on how powerful food is, I wanted to bring that forward once and for all. Give people the best information possible on the metabolism side, but I want to give you all of the clinical evidence we have on how specific foods and nutrients can literally improve your memory. Right now, how specific foods and nutrients can improve your ability to focus, can, re can reduce test anxiety and stress, specific foods that are proven to affect your ability to have patience and even your proclivity towards violence. We have data on all of these things. What specific foods and nutrients create the sleep-related hormones and neurotransmitters that enable you to have a good night's sleep? We're just going to layer it over and over and over again until you understand when I make a decision about the food that I eat, how remarkable it really is. Yeah. Instead of that one little pithy thing, which is this is going to affect my, my metabolism somehow. It's going to be so layered and so empowering because all this stuff is just we go on an adventure. And one of the things we do, we actually look into the history of the calorie itself and why that became the dominant part of the conversation and how it's affected us and made us so, it's created, created this very twisted perception of food. And if I can, I'll talk just a little bit about where it all started. Yeah, yeah, I want you to go, man. Awesome. So when calories, and you're a big student of this as well, you even sent me some wonderful books, but like if we look at the, the, the ancient Romans, ancient Greeks, you know, even the ancient Egyptians, nobody wrote or said shit about a calorie. <laughs> it wasn't a thing. You know, this was a time when people just ate. People just ate food. And can, it's hard for us to actually imagine a time. Can you imagine just actually eating food, just eating without all of the psychological and, you know, the measuring and all the stuff that we do, even if we're not intending to do? This is because also this was a time when food was just food. It was just food. But when the calorie was discovered, nobody was really looking for it as far as a nutritional metric. It was used in engineering and physics. The person who kind of parlayed that into the nutritional world was Wilbur Atwater, which he's a little bit of a side note, even though we use the Atwater system on product labeling. The person who really impressed it in the culture, she's a absolutely a pioneer, Dr. Lulu Hunt Peters. She wrote a nutritional mega bestseller in the early part of the 1900s sold over 2 million copies at that time. Wow. Basically anybody that can read had this freaking book. All right. And part of the, 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 the book was called the key to calories. And she made the shift from food being this multifaceted, dynamic, powerful entity that creates our neurons, that creates our dendrites, that creates the cells of our heart, our liver, the list goes on and on to turning food into numbers. And she said, from now on, you will not eat food. You will eat calories of food. You will, not, you, will, you will no longer eat a slice of bread. You will eat 100 calories of bread. You will no longer eat a slice of pie. You'll eat 350 calories of pie. And she relented that a woman of her height could eat whatever she wanted, so long as she maintained a strict diet of 1,200 calories. But the side notes to this stuff, so consistently, even in my nutritional science class, Dr. Peters battled with her weight her entire life. She never got it figured out. My nutritional science teacher was overweight, significantly overweight. And yet he's doing the things that he believes. He's doing the things that he's teaching. It's not that he's like sneaking off and, you know, guzzling a big gulp. He's, he's following these metrics that have been proven to be unsuccessful. And so that's one part. Shifting of seeing food in terms of numbers and not the dynamic thing that it really is. The second part was the indoctrination of our culture in associating food with morality. And so she used words like punishment and sin and asserting that it's a character defect if you cannot control your weight. And the, the last thing, so that's two of the big things that have become a part of our culture. The last thing that she was really powerful at doing, and I know you've seen this as well, she created the connection between weight loss being a side effect of making yourself chronically hungry. She relented. This was during a time of food rationing, you know, World War I. 
She said that for every hunger pang you feel, you should have a double joy knowing that you're saving the hunger pangs in another person. So the goal was to strive for hunger. And that hunger is an indicator that it's working. So many people come into my office just having this subconscious belief that if they're not hungry, they're not doing it right. That's when the weight loss magic is happening. But you know, and you're one of the people, and I actually mentioned you in the book, hunger, there is a normal biological hunger we can experience. But when it becomes chronic, when it becomes consistent and, and the abnormal amount of cravings, all these things, this is biological feedback. Something's wrong. Yes. There's something wrong that we need to fix. And so all of these things, we start to unpack and find the real solutions because now today we know what's regulating our hunger. One of the big takeaways and big tenets is chronic nutrient deficiency leads to chronic hunger. Yeah. Chronic nutrient deficiency leads to chronic overeating. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's so interesting. One of the things, I, as I was skimming through, um, you talk a lot about um, the brain in this book. And to me, I always go, people oftentimes ask, they're like, well, talking about the metabolism, they'll mention thyroid, they'll mention other things. And I go, no, it's, it's actually the brain. And one of the things you touch on in here is the hypothalamus and how the hypothalamus essentially, for lack of a better word, gets sort of scrambled by inflammation, infectious agents, uh, you know, sort of the way we confuse it with the environment that we sort of expose ourselves to. And, and you know what it struck me for as I was reading, you know, and flipping through this, you remember that book? Um, a lot of you will remember this. So it, it, a while back, it was called uh, You on a Diet. I think it made, um, what's his name? What's the guy's name? Uh, Oz. Dr. Oz. Made Dr. Oz famous. Now, you and I were both in this field at this time. And I remember getting this in this book and essentially going, ah, it's okay. I wouldn't necessarily say that this is the, the, the sort of diet book because it didn't actually, um, you know, it made the promise that it was going to explain to you how things work. I think one of the things you've done in this book, from what I can see, is really explaining to people exactly how the metabolism and the brain and the body and even down to the fat cells and chemicals they're secreting and the way the body is talking back and forth, how it actually works. And when you get that information, you said something earlier on as we were talking where you essentially said, you know, once you have this major insight, you can't not see it. That's the power of a book like this. And, and I know a lot of people, they, they do want to focus on, well, let me lose the weight. But the fact of the matter is, just like you were saying, Sean, like once you understand, you will start doing things subtly different that you don't, aren't even fully aware of that start to make the difference. Like the way I always see it is it's like, look, we have several goals with this, right? It's, it's look good, feel good, live longer, function better. And everyone goes, let's look better. And I think where you're coming from and where I come from, too, is it's like, let's actually eat to function better and eat to live longer. And looking good is a natural outcome of this. This is essentially what you were saying with the, you know, the ancient Romans and Greeks and, you know, um, Paleolithic type, uh, you know, indigenous people. This is what they do. And so let me ask you this. If, now, I know in this book at the back, you have a 30-day sort of uh, jumpstart plan. So you basically lay it out for people. So I know you, you give them what they want because a lot of people are like, okay, tell me what to do. So Sean does that. But I love the way it's tucked in the back of the book. And the front of the book is all essentially this encyclopedia of what you need to know, giving you basically a degree in your biochemistry. So what, I, what I'm curious about is, what would be like for you? And I don't think I've ever really asked you this question. And I know sleep is going to be there. So because obviously you wrote a best selling book on sleep. So let's forget about sleep for a minute and tell me if you were to say, Jay, listen, for most people, here are the three things that they should be doing that this book essentially teaches you how goes into more depth on. If you had to say, look, these are the one, two, three of it. What would that be? All right. This is so good, man. All right. So one of the things that and I, you're hearing it here first with Jay Tita, one of these terms that I want to kind of impress and create a, as a part of our lexicon is epicaloric. All right. Epicaloric control. There are specific things that are controlling what calories do in your body. I mentioned a little bit about, you know, some of the history of calories. It's not that it can't be a valuable tool or metric that we use, but it's understanding that a calorie is a you, um, a measurement of energy, just like a meter is a measurement of distance. The difference is if I measure this room or I measure the street outside, that measurement is going to be consistent. That unit of, of caloric energy 
is going to be radically different in different metabolisms, different bodies, even in your body a week from now, a, sp- a year from now. We each have a unique metabolic fingerprint. And this is something to first and foremost understand. There's never been a human in the history of humanity that's had a metabolism just like yours. And there never will be. And you won't even have a metabolism like yours next week. It's constantly changing and fluid. And it it can be so empowering, but our diet frameworks tend to put us into a, a box that can end up hurting us. And we have to have the tools and insights to be able to listen to this guidance system, this very, very amazing system that we have to make the right decisions for us. And so uh, one of the things for folks that are kind of big idea to take away, number one, is this epicaloric control. And so I'll just share a couple of these pieces because there's really six of them, but you mentioned one of them, which is no, there's no diet program talking about in order for you to reduce your body weight, reduce your body fat, we need to address this inflammation in your brain. All right, because your hypothalamus is helping to regulate the endocrine glands, this producing the fat related, you know, fat storing or fat loss hormones, if you want to lump them into these categories, it's regulating those processes and your metabolism could be slowed by hundreds and hundreds of calories a day just by this inflammation. All right. So epicaloric number, that's one, just highlight this very just tickling on the brain part. But the other part is something we've been saying in science, you know, folks, especially operating at a high level for years. But now I'm going to make sure everybody knows this. It's not just the 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 calorie. It's the quality of the calorie. And this is highlighted in this really interesting study. And this was conducted by no, this was published in Food and Nutrition Research. And so I kind of unpacked this study in Eat Smarter. They wanted to find out what happens with folks calorie expenditure when they eat a meal of whole foods versus a meal of processed foods. And so their whole food meal was what they deemed to be whole foods was multi-grain bread and cheddar cheese. The processed food meal was white bread and cheese product. And cheese product, you're like, what the hell is cheese product? Nobody's eating that. That's craft. Yeah, craft singles. They can't even legally call it cheese. There's not enough cheese in the cheese. <laughs> so they had folks that consume these sandwiches. The sandwiches were the exact same amount of calories, same amount of proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. On paper, same thing. Now, here's what happened. The folks who ate the processed food sandwich had a 50% reduction in calorie burn after eating that sandwich. Now, the question is why? The very nature or unnatural or abnormal nature of what they consumed created disruption within their metabolism. It created like sort of these hormonal clogs and change the way their body associated with that energy coming in from that food and making the body more stingy and hanging on to that energy is throwing things off. And so the type of food matters so much. It's, it's above caloric control. It's epicaloric. All right. Again, you heard it here first. Epicaloric is born today. <laughs> I'm going to share one other thing that's above uh, caloric control that controls what calories are doing in your body. And one of the big takeaways from the book, this can really be number two. Uh, here just as an important principle and tenant. I know everybody listening at this point has heard the importance of your microbiome at this point, but I mean, we're really, really going to dig in on this one. Your gut microbes, this vast array of bacteria, fungi, viruses, archaea, all of this stuff that exists in our gut, they are the first determinant on whether or not you're going to absorb the calories, what your body's going to do with the calories, Etc. And here's why. Researchers, and this was published in the journal Cell, they found a specific strain of bacteria in mice that blocked their intestines from absorbing as many calories from their food. Now, with our allopath, allopathic lens, I know I thought it, let's bottle that shit up, bottle up whatever bacteria that was, and sell it so people stop absorbing as many calories from their food. The problem is, what happens to everything else? Does that disrupt your ability to? absorb and, and make B12? Does it, you know, da, 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 the list goes on and on because we're doing this unnatural thing in a vacuum. And life is so much more complex than that. And so, but that's, of course, and that's a mouse study. Couple that with human studies conducted by researchers at the Wiseman Institute. I know this, if I have somebody, if I send out for a stool sample, you know, they poop in like a little uh, lunch container, basically. <laughs> Like that, the, French fry basket. Come in. the French <laughs> yeah. fry basket. The French fry yeah. basket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they poop in a French fry basket. They send it off. 
without me ever even seeing this person, meeting this person, knowing what this person looked like, when I see their their bacteria makeup, the, the, the cascade of bacteria that they're carrying, I can tell whether or not they're obese before I even see them. Yeah. We now know there's a microbiome makeup that is associated with insulin resistance and obesity. And so the researchers took fecal samples from obese test subjects and they, you know, this quote fat bacteria and implanted this into lean mice. Then they took samples from lean human subjects and implanted those into lean mice. The lean mice, the mice receiving the, the fecal transplant from the lean human subjects, nothing happened. Stay the same, same lean mice. But receiving the fat bacteria from the obese test subjects caused the mice to become insulin resistant, caused them to gain weight, and caused them to gain body fat. Simply by introducing bacteria associated with obesity. So one more part of this, identical twins. They took identical twins and they the prerequisite, they found that one identical twin, they needed to have one that had the microbiome associated with obesity and insulin resistance. Even though they're freaking identical twins, same diet, same household, the twin who had the microbiome associated with obesity and insulin resistance gained weight while the other one did not. All right, this is real stuff. These are things that are controlling what calories do in your body. And so a big walk away, number one, is broadening our understanding of calories. Number two, focusing on healing and, and really kind of optimizing what's happening in our microbiome. And then the last piece would be, I mean, there's so many, man, but if you got, if I got to like really share one, I am more than ever so adamant about the importance of DHA and EPA. It is so phenomenal. When you see the data that I go through on the metabolism side, it's going to knock your socks off, but in particular for your brain. And the human brain is the most amazing, powerful uh, uh, entity in the known universe. It absolutely is. And it's so, the, iron, the irony of it is that this powerful, infinitely infinite potential entity is also as fragile as my feelings after like watching Toy Story 3, you know, <laughs> it's delicate, but nature doesn't come to the party without a solution. You have your, you know, it's the only organ is like fully encased in protective bone, but you also also have an internal security system in the form of your, you know, the blood brain barrier. Now here's what's interesting. Not everything you eat can get to your brain. Your brain is very, very selective. It has its own neuronutrition. And your brain actually makes a lot of stuff on its own that it won't allow in. And like one of those things, you know, saturated fat has been vilified, vindicated, vilified, vindicated. It's one of the most important make, things that make up your, the human brain itself. But this is in early childhood. When we're infants, mother's milk, it can be upwards of 50% saturated fat. So to say saturated fat is bad, is, it's so negligent, you know? But then our ability, the, you know, the human brain's kind of like sopping it up, the sponge action of sopping up saturated fat goes down as a child gets a little bit older. And when you're an adult, you all but don't even absorb any saturated fat from your diet into your brain. Your brain will make it itself if it needs it, all right? Okay, so that's saturated fat. Here's DHA. There are, I think of the blood-brain barrier as being like a toll situation. You know, there are some things that you get stopped at the toll booth, but this is like a big security guard. Jay Tita's there at the toll booth, uh, making sure that only the right stuff gets through. And something that has an express pathway to the human brain is DHA, all right, DHA and EPA. So this is category of omega-3 fats. But what was found, this is uh, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. This is just one. I've got so many points of data here in Eat Smarter, but just one of them found that simply increasing your intake of DHA randomized placebo controlled trial directly within a matter of days improves your memory. All right. It is that remarkable. Also, it was found to improve focus. Now here's the other side of the coin. Okay, cool. My brain works better. In test subjects, and they use MRIs, test subjects with the lowest intake of DHA and EPA had the greatest amount of brain shrinkage. Now, dude, this is not like it's cold outside shrinkage. Like that, you know, it's not that temporary. This is like 
can really mess up your entire life brain shrinkage, yeah, you know? No so, and this is the difference between thinking that eating fat d- directly becomes fat on our bodies and also thinking that eating fat directly can nourish our fat brain because the brain is made of a different type of fat. It's made of structural fats, not storage fats. If your brain, this is just an evolutionary advantage. If our brain was made of storage fats and we were experiencing a time of famine, your brain would literally be able to eat itself, you know, homemade zombie food. And so these structural fats, this is what DHA operates as. The plasticity, the structure, the, the, the overall just integrity, transduction, brain cells being able to communicate with each other. DHA is so freaking important. And this is one of the things that is so widely overlooked today still. And what the researchers found was just over four, uh, we'll just say, I'll just put this in everyday terms, 1.2 teaspoons was all it took. That's that baseline to prevent brain shrinkage. All right. So what does this look like? What are the practical applications to walk away with today? I'm a big fan of food first. And the data shows up when we think about DHA and EPA, most folks think of fish, fatty fish. So we got salmon, mackerel, the list goes on and on, sardines. But most interesting in working with all, you know, the folks that I know, you know, top neuroscientists, salmon roe and caviar can have three times as much DHA in the same amount of product, Mm. super dense sources, right? But then like we also, this is inclusive. Eat Smarter is inclusive. Whatever diet framework you subscribe to, we're taking the best tenets from all of them. And so if somebody's taking a vegan protocol, vegetarian protocol, of course, I understand there's a a place of ethics, but we have to do what's best for us. And I still keep pointing people back to that, but there are ways we can manage this, but I want you to know how important DHA is. The omega-3s in plants is not the same. It's not the same of what's in animal products. That's ALA. It's so important to your body. It can convert some, and ALA has benefits by the way, but the chia seeds, flax seeds, hemp seeds, that ALA your body can convert some of it to DHA, but it can lose 80, 90% in the conversion process. So you'll end up, you'll need to eat so much. You'll need to just like get a beer bong, just wear around all day, just dropping hemp seeds in there to try to meet your needs. Like you're going to need so much and it's just not a viable thing. So what do we do? Food first, the journal Neurology found that test subjects who ate one seafood meal per week did in fact perform better on cognitive skills tests than folks who eat less than one. We know it works. What has the most clinical evidence with DHA and EPA? Fish oil. It just does. That's where most of the studies are at, 99% of them. Krill oil, that's another step that we need to look to if we're doing a vegetarian vegan protocol. It's gaining more and more um, evidence and also has some cool things in there like like astaxanthin. But being that it's a microscopic shrimp that might rub our system, you know, rub our ethics the wrong way. It's just like, it's a shrimp, just because we're using the word shrimp. But truly, if you just like lick the air, you'll probably kill more, you know, uh, sentient organisms. Yeah, it right? starts but, to become, it starts to become a limiting factor when you start the deeper you go with the with this, for sure. It, that's right. And the last one for folks is that really kind of um, uh, dense plant source we can put in that category is the algae oil. Now, it doesn't have a lot of clinical evidence. It just doesn't. But we do know that there's DHA and EPA there. So I would recommend at minimum folks getting themselves an an algae oil because please understand DHA, EPA, they are so freaking important for the health of your brain and your metabolism. I can't stress it enough. And I think that there's going to be a big increase in the market's intelligence and, and focus on these things. And hopefully we could find more viable ways of getting these things in. And I just shared some of the foods. It's in, there's grass-fed beef, egg yolks, many different and sources. And you cover those. But, you yeah. cover everything in detail here, man. I, you also There's also an interesting uh, discussion in here about dairy, because I know dairy is another controversial food. So Sean essentially covers that. But let me just, to wrap up, I want to I wanna basically go through and tell, tell you what I think uh, you're hearing. Also give some clinical stuff from my end to to sort of bolster and get your thoughts on it, then we can begin to wrap up. But it sounds like from, if we take these three big pieces, number one, it sounds like what you're trying to educate us on is you're essentially saying, Jade, listen, everyone who's listening, the calories are not where we want to really be focusing. It's not a really good measure for the amount of nutrient density that we have, uh, you know, that we need as humans. And so we really want to be looking at 
quality of food. And I will say this in my clinical experience, and I know you and I have talked about this, it is almost always the case, not always, but almost always the case. When you fix the quality of someone's food, it is very difficult for them to overconsume energetics. It's very difficult for them to overconsume calories. Let's just face it. If you're eating vegetable matter and, you know, things that you could pick or kill these whole foods, you're really not going to be able to, for most people. Now there are some, my brother's one of them. I might be as well (laughs) that can overeat healthy foods, but in general, um, that's going to be an issue. And you're also pointing out here that we have to look and say, this is not an exact science anyway, never was still is not. And the only true way to know if you're in a calorie deficit, as far as I'm concerned, is that you're losing fat right? That you, that's how, you know, and that level is going to be a little bit different, but the body's going to be measuring all these things. The second thing is the microbiome. You and I have been steeped in, in this particular research and it is absolutely fascinating. And I think I concur with you where I essentially say, there's no doubt in my mind that a big piece, not the whole piece, but a big piece of this issue, as we get our heads wrapped around the power of the microbiome is going to be settled there. And your book definitely talks about how people uh, can understand that science and utilize it. And I think the final thing is, is, and and I'll actually give you an interesting, this is clinical. I don't have any data. Maybe you do on this. But one of the things I have noticed throughout my career is that um, giving people high amounts of fish oils who need them, and these are typically people that you'll know if you need them because you're someone who's been eating junk food your whole life and really don't eat much seafood and are eating burgers and pizzas and things like that. When you begin to give these oils, now, of course, most of the time I'm doing a lot of other things, so it's very difficult to pinpoint this, but I would say that it, to me, is one of the things that I think shuts down hunger in the brain. It partly, and when you think about it, part of it is the brain essentially saying, A, I'm getting what I need, and B, these things are notorious for their anti-inflammatory effects. And so maybe we're getting sort of dual effects there. But one of the things that I think is critical is um, that you're pointing out is uh, these, these also, by the way, for the, our little energy factories, those mitochondria in our cells, they also are built of fat and phospholipids, and they, that needs to be uh, taken care of for every little part of our cells uh, to, to function. So I feel like these, uh, these are really powerful things that I've seen in my clinical career and are also studying. And I just want to see, do you have any other, other things to say on those or, you know, in terms of what you've seen clinically and then any other thing you want to add? And then I know you're busy and you got a ton of interviews, so I'll, I'll let you go, but any, any other things that you want to just pick up on there and then any final things you want to leave us with? Ah oh, man, I love talking to you and just listening to you, man. It's it's same, so, man. It's like the, it's so the best, awesome. man. So you know, just to that point, with I just feel again. I think the brain takes it very, very seriously. Shrinkage. All right, nobody. You know, the brain. If the brain was naked, it would not want to be showing itself off when it's <laughs> shrinking. All right, and so I think just because of that, it really does. It is definitely a big driver of our hunger because as we evolved. In a natural setting, there's this phenomenon it's called post-ingestive feedback. And so as we evolved, and also there's animal studies that affirm this, when we would eat certain foods and certain flavor sensations that come along with those things, your body is like taking notes. It's, it's like, okay, I just ate this particular food and I got some copper. I got some magnesium. I got some omega-3s. I know where I can get that. Next time I need it, I'm going to set in place a craving for that particular taste. All right? Super cool stuff. So we go through the science of flavor in the book too. Today, of course, our tastes have been hijacked, you know, to a crazy degree. And we talk a little bit about that. But knowing that and that the brain takes it so seriously, this brain shrinkage, it's going to really drive you. And once you bring, once you finally bring in that nutrient that it needs, which in the, you know, again, mega threes are so important in maintaining the structure of the brain itself. That's why it does help to kind of deactivate those hunger and the, the hunger and those cravings, you know, so I totally agree with that. Mm-hmm. And of course, more things are going to be coming out, but it's just one of those things that's just super logical. Yeah. And I guess the other part that I would, would want to just touch on a little bit really quickly is you mentioned something else, the phospholipids, you know, phospholipids are also m- mainly made of omega threes. And then we get into, you know, acetylcholine. There's so many other things, but these are things we can get these directly 
create and support the structure of our neurons, their ability to communicate this transduction. All of these things are based on these nutrients that are so deficient in many people's diets. So if we can start getting healthier brains, like feeding our brain, I truly do believe that we can start to have healthier conversations, you know, and the data plays that out as well. You know, there's a big lack of, you know, understanding right now. Things are so polarized and just being able to perspective take and have patience. And one of the studies that I talked about in the book was done at The Ohio State University. And they just kind of, you know, uh, inspired blood sugar crash, you know, and this is easy to do, you know, you eat high, you know, processed food, you know, high glycemic, whatever. And then you have the impending crash. We have this term now in, in, in the, in popular culture called hangry, but this is a real, this is a real thing. Mm -hmm. All right. This, yep. When your blood sugar crashes like that, your body takes, it's a, it's a survival mechanism. It takes that very seriously because it wants normal functioning. So catecholamines are getting released, adrenaline, cortisol, just working to kick that blood sugar back up to where it needs to be. The side effect is those catecholamines can also incite aggression mm. and irritation. And so what they found was that the test subjects who had abnormal blood sugar were far less likely to resolve conflicts with their partner. They felt more aggressive towards their partner and less patient. We know this stuff. Now we have more data on it. We know it and we so often in our lives, I love my wife to pieces. I freaking love her face. I love her. <laughs> All right. But man, whenever we would get into it, it's just like we started to catch the things. It would be like, and it's always something stupid. Like, why you got one shoe in the bathroom and one shoe, you know, in the kitchen? Like, what is, what is it? You know? And it's usually, and I got this checklist now. And as of course you have to work on yourself. It's not just all food, of course, but food is a major driver of it. But I check in with myself. Am I, am I hungry? Right. Just basic questions. Am, am I deficient in something? Like, is there something that I'm not getting that's making me irritated? Am I stressed? Am I sleep deprived? Is she sleep deprived? Is she excessively stressed? And so I could have more compassion and support her. I know when her spots are. And we make jokes about it now, like, babe, you just need to eat something, you know? And we can even tell each other that now, like, babe, I'll talk to you in five minutes. I just got to, I need to sit down and just have something. Okay. So please. And of course it could be a little bit of a, you know, like, well, whatever, you can't talk to me, you know, that kind of thing. But over time, you just start to understand we can have healthier conversations and really be able to, to connect when our basic needs are met. You know, it's not that it's impossible to have compassion when you're unhealthy and unwell, it's just harder. And so my mission is to get our citizens healthier so we can have healthier conversations. I love it. And you know, you just, you summed up what I think is probably the simplest way to think about metabolism when you're having biofeedback. Everyone should understand this about the metabolism. It really only has one stress response under any stress. And that stress really is the starvation response. And so this is what happens. It basically says, hey, you're under stress and then you go, I must be starving. And that turns you into an aggressive person, somebody who is hangry, somebody who has cravings, someone who has hungry, someone who can't focus on anything but food, someone who doesn't want to have social interactions, someone who is simply focused on survival. This is what the metabolism does. And when you think about it from that way, it's always sending these signals. And to me, so, you know, it's funny people, I don't know if they tell you this, Sean, but people say this all the time. They're like, well, I don't know that I can get the book, right? Everyone's like, not everyone can get the book. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like books are, you know, I don't know. They're about the cheapest form of insurance that you could possibly have. So none of that excuse, this, per, this to me is like, you know, going to go down as one of the Bibles and your last book was too. This is just the work you do that everyone needs to have. We humans, next level human, we have four jobs we have to do, health and fitness, finance, purpose and meaning and personal relationships. And I honestly don't think you could do any of those without your health. So thank you so much for your work, man. You know, I love you, respect you, just uh, think the too, work man. you're doing is amazing. And um, let's just go through briefly for those who don't know Sean Stevens, not many people left who don't know you, but tell us, Tell them where they can find you. The book's coming out, uh, I think, December 29th, right, is the, is right. the date. So just tell us really quickly, where do they get more of you and um, all the good stuff on, on you and where to find you? Awesome, man. I appreciate it so much. So you can pick up the book anywhere books are sold, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, all the good stuff. Of course, 
uh, independent bookstores could really use some love right now. Um, so, but the book is going to be available nationwide and also in a couple of other, other countries, December 29th. We're ending this year on a high note. And then we're coming into 2020 with, 2021 with some new momentum. We have a national wellness campaign kicking off with Target stores on uh, January 3rd. That's all huge, right, so. man. That's so cool. You're going to be in all the targets. Sean was telling me, too. He's like, Jake, you know, I used to work. I used to work at Target. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's so nuts. You know, I was I was a, quote, floater. So I was like, I do the cards and I work in electronics, whatever you need me to do when I was in high school. And now, you know, my book is going to be there in every Target store in America. But this just speaks to the demand. There's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. You know, and so this is part of a 2021 wellness campaign, a little special feature that they'll have in the stores and just getting access, you know, exposure, people being able to see this book, to pick it up. And it, I promise you, every single page, once you hit chapter one, every page, you will find an aha moment. And so I'm really, really proud of that, really excited about it. And so you can pick the book up everywhere. Books are sold. And uh, where you're listening to this amazing podcast, you can find my show, The Model Health Show. Uh, we have a great time there. We do master classes on different subject matters. Uh, so you can look me up there as well. Sean, dude, we're so lucky to have you. Thank you for your work. Thanks for coming and hanging with us, man. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. It's my honor. My honor. <laughs>